Hello and welcome to the Temple Mount podcast. I am Shogun. Thank you all for joining me today. It's an important uh, part of the server history. This podcast is to discuss the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar are the inspiration for the Temple Mount server. The name the Temple Mount is in reference to them and their adventures and accomplishments. And as you guys have noticed, the images and the artworks that we use are also uh, Temple Mount and uh, Knights Templar based. So today we want to go into the history, the mystery, the conspiracy, the symbolism, the mythology of the Knights Templar, who were both a historical and real group of people, very real group of elite soldiers and warriors, but also have spawned all kinds of uh, influences on the conspiracy theory world, art, culture, all the way to modern drug cartels and Freemasons and secret societies. And some people think the Knights Templar are basically behind everything in the conspiracy theory world. We are listening to some uh, presentations today about how they're sort of the top of the pyramid. Now, whether that's true or not, there's certainly a lot to unpack here, more than we could even do in one podcast. But this will be a great start. Before we get started, uh, please join the Temple Mount Discord server. We record this podcast every day, usually at about 9.30 Central, as well as other times, so keep an eye on the announcements channel. Uh, again, thank you so much to Rafi and Hugh for their excellent work recording and uploading. We're getting podcasts up every single day, so make sure you've liked, followed, and subscribed to the different channels. You can find them in the Temple Mount podcast and Temple Mount SoundCloud channels at the top of the Temple Mount Discord server. That uh, being said, welcome, everybody. So... Um, the Knights Templar are fascinating, right? So if you look at the general chat, I'm going to post a few things that kind of uh, illustrate this. So first, I'm just going to post a, a picture of a Templar, and I'll post a few. You guys have already seen them. Uh, well, actually, first of all, I'm going to post the symbol of the Knights Templar, which is really interesting. Uh, so this is in general chat. This is their sigil uh, or seal or emblem. And so a few interesting things. First, you can notice that their colors are white and red. Uh, they wear white tabards, and um, they are actually not only warriors, but like monks, basically. They're part of a monastic order, uh, so each of them take uh, monk vows, right? So they swear celibacy, right? They're not allowed to have sex with women. Uh, poverty, they're not allowed to own any private property, and obedience or fidelity, so they live to serve. And you can notice something very unusual, right? These knights are sharing a horse, two knights, one horse. Uh, why is this? This symbolizes that they took a vow of poverty. Uh, so when the Knights Templar started out, they lived by begging, just like a, a begging monk or an itinerant monk. They survived on donations. Uh, and so to that extent, they would even have to share a horse, two knights on one horse. Now, this is like almost supremely ironic because the Knights Templar very quickly went on to be unbelievably wealthy, uh, like mind-bogglingly impossibly wealthy and actually ended up inventing banking and becoming international bankers and, you know, whole kingdoms would, kings wanted to cede like a third of their kingdom. All kinds of wealthy young nobles gave all their property to this order. So they very quickly became extremely wealthy, but each individual knight took a vow of poverty uh, to own no property or possessions whatsoever. And whatever they did own when they joined the order, they would give completely to the order. So the order was wealthy, but the individual knights, uh, in principle, had nothing. And as you can see, their, their symbol is the red cross, right? You can see on their shields and on their tabards, they wear the red cross. The red cr cross, of course, represents Jesus Christ. They were Christians. And so what were the Knights Templar? Well, they were what was called a holy order or a, an, a knightly order. And so they were um, a group of knights, noble knights, warriors, uh, elite, but bound together into a religious brotherhood, a monastic religious brotherhood. And they were only one of several knightly orders that existed and operated at that time. Uh, other important ones were the Knights Hospitallers, uh, the Teutonic Knights, uh, and we actually still have some of these today, believe it or not, such as the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem and uh, the Knights of Malta. Those are two knightly orders that still exist under the present day with thousands of knights under arms, meaning like actually armed knights. So this is different than like when Paul McCartney or whatever became a knight. That's just sort of a social prestige status. But a knight under arms, these are actually like uh, warriors. So they had a particular purpose. So they were actually called the Knights, uh, the Poor Knights of the Temple of Solomon, something like that. So poor, again, referring to their uh, poverty. The Temple of Solomon 
this is what the Temple Mount thing comes down to. So in the Holy Land uh, of Jerusalem, there's a very sacred mountain. And on that mountain was the former location of a very important temple. That was Solomon's temple, the temple created by the biblical King Solomon, which is described in the Bible and which becomes such a focus of Jewish, um, I, I want to say obsession, really, with no disrespect. It's an obsession to the Jewish culture. The temple, right? You've heard of the second temple. Uh, the first temple was destroyed. They built the second temple. second temple was destroyed. And now they have uh, a commitment to eventually rebuild the third temple. However, currently on the Temple Mount is a mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And we actually thoughtlessly used that in our uh, server art originally, but it's quite a politically contested thing. So currently the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock, is on the temple. But in the past, it was the Temple of Solomon. And for a time, the Knights Templar occupied, protected, and had custody of that temple, which is why they're called the Knights of the Temple of Solomon. So they, they guarded that uh, temple. But that wasn't their only purpose. Uh, their primary purpose was to provide armed security to pilgrims. So because of how sacred these locations in Jerusalem were, there was a steady flow of Christian pilgrims who wanted to go there because of the uh, importance this place had in you know, the Bible and the life of Jesus and so forth. So people would go on pilgrimage. But as you know, uh, this area is the Middle East and was inhabited and controlled by Muslims. Uh, and the Muslims were not always on super friendly terms with the Christian pilgrims. So quite a lot of Christian pilgrims would be killed or robbed uh, on their way to do these pilgrimages. So it was decided that they should create an order of uh, warrior priests who would guard the pilgrims so that the Christians could make these pilgrimages. So that was the uh, explicit purpose of the um, Knights Templar. And the founder of the Knights Templar was a guy named Hugh de Payne. And I think, um, I think it's Payen, but it's like Hugh de Payne or Hugh de Payne. He was the founder of the Knights Templar. Uh, but without another character called Bernard Clairvaux, it's unlikely that the Knights Templar ever would have got off the ground. Bernard Clairvaux was a very important and influential Christian at that time. And he was actually the founder of something called the Cistercian Order or the Order of the Cistercian Monks. So he was very influential, and he endorsed this concept of these holy knights. And so a lot of people got behind it, and they were given money, and also a special papal bull. So the Pope, the papacy, puts out a bull. A bull is like a legally binding proclamation. And so uh, he proclaimed that they were exempt from taxes and exempt from laws. So they were not bound by law themselves and they were not bound for taxes, but they could collect taxes. And actually they implemented the first ever income tax, which was a crusade tax so that people would give a little bit of their money to fund the crusades and they didn't have to pay taxes. So you can see how they would grow quite wealthy. They also had some really interesting powers. Like if a Knights Templar was walking outside and he saw a man being led to the scaffold to be executed, he had the ability to pardon that man and just say, let this man go free. He could save somebody's life, uh, which is quite interesting. He could also cut uh, a body down that was hanging on the scaffold and order it to be given a Christian burial, like a, a criminal who otherwise wouldn't have been. That's just sort of an interesting side note. And I just want to point out the other important orders come into the story later in their interaction with the Knights Templar. One of the big ones called the Knights Hospitallers. So the Knights Hospitallers, another big powerful knightly order that coexisted with the Knights Templar, their role was to defend hospitals. So hospitals could come under attack. <laughs> so the Knights Hospitallers existed to provide medical care and to guard hospitals. And I'm quite sure are tied into the origin of the modern Red Cross, right? So when you hear the term Red Cross today, you think of medical um, services. But as you can see, the Red Cross was also worn by the Knights Templar, who were warriors and killers, right? And so first of all, they guarded pilgrims, but they also fought in the Crusades. And not only did they fight in the Crusades, they did the lion's share of the fighting in the Crusades. And essentially, the Knights Templar were more effective and more important militarily than like all the other Crusaders put together. Uh, so they were so effective and so formidable in battle in the role of what's called shot cavalry, that in their greatest victory, 500 Knights Templar defeated 30,000 enemy warriors uh, in battle. And those enemy warriors were 
led by a very formidable Muslim general named Saladin. So Saladin ends up being their uh, main antagonist. Saladin was a brilliant and charismatic Muslim general, uh, and he was the main enemy of the Knights Templar. And at times he defeated them, and at other times they defeated him. But they succeeded in fighting the Crusades all the way to the Holy Land, all the way to Jerusalem, and all the way to the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. Wouldn't have been called the Dome of the Rock now, because that's the modern mosque. But they went all the way to Jerusalem. They succeeded, right? That was the whole point of the Crusades, was to retake the Holy Land from the Muslims for the Christians because of its importance to the Christian religion. The Knights Templar succeeded at that. And for some time, they had bases and castles all through the Middle East, all through Europe. And so they guarded the pilgrims. They basically won the crusades single-handedly. And again, what is shot cavalry? Well, shot cavalry is heavily armored, elite, heavily armed, heavily trained. And basically when you have units like this, they can kind of crash through lesser soldiers like a, a bowling ball goes through bowling pins. So they were called shot cavalry because if you look up and you see that picture of the, uh, the charging knights there, you see them all on their horses that would shock you, right? And it would shock you, like I said, it would be like bowling ball hitting a bunch of bowling pins. So again, 500 of those guys smashed through 30,000 enemies and routed them. So they're called shot cavalry because they could run ahead of their army and just smash through armies and, and just break them, basically. And they did that very well. So they're very, very elite, deadly warriors. But they also invented modern banking, so to speak, or international banking. you probably find some people will contend that some other place did, but... They were one of the original pioneers of banking. So because they guarded pilgrims, right, if you're a pilgrim and you're going from, you know, um, Europe, right, from France or whatever, Germany, and you're going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, be quite dangerous uh, and unwise to carry a bunch of gold and silver and jewelry with you because that's just making yourself a more attractive target to um, raiders and bandits who are going to steal, kill you and steal it. So not only would the Knights Templar escort these pilgrims to protect them, they would also allow them to make deposits uh, in their wealth at one of the Knight Templar bases, and then they'd be issued like a check, right? And then when they got to another Knights Templar base, they could give the check and receive the equivalent, right? So if I dropped 100 pieces of gold at the Knight Templar base in France, when I get to the Knight Templar base in Jerusalem, I can show this little check and they'll give me 100 pieces of gold so I didn't have to carry that gold with me. This is pretty revolutionary and basically the birth of modern banking. So when you put together the fact that these guys were generously funded by kings, that young nobles were eager to join and would then give up all their property to these guys because they took a vow of poverty, and they were tax exempt, and they could levy taxes, and they invented banking, the amount of wealth and money that they started to accrue was phenomenal, right? So, so much so that they were creditors to kings. So kings would borrow money from them. And this is a lesson for everybody. Uh, you don't necessarily want people to owe you too much. Because if people owe you more than they want to pay back, they might think of ways to not have to pay you back. And this is the origin of the downfall of the Knights Templar. Quote, unquote, downfall. Because are they really gone? Or did they actually continue to exist? So basically, there was a French king. Uh, I think his name was, I should know this, it might be King Peter. But he's a French king. He owed them a phenomenal amount of money. And basically, what happened is there's some rumors started circulating around about the Knights Templar having some secret occult practices. And uh, basically, they started saying that during the initiation rites of the Knights Templar, they would spit on the cross and step on the cross and that they worshipped a severed head that could talk and give prophecies. And ultimately, they started saying they worship Baphomet. And if you guys know, Baphomet is that black goat character with breasts and a penis, and he's sort of associated with Satanism and Luciferianism. So all of this was used as perjury and slander against the Knights Templar. And we're told that it was on Friday the 13th that the Knights Templar were finally betrayed, right? They were very famous and very well respected because they had, you know, won the Crusades and, and won the Holy Land and all these great things. But all of a sudden they're being accused of these things by this French king. And on Friday the 13th, supposedly, according to legend, they sort of did a sting where they were all arrested en masse out of nowhere, like all rounded up. 
And then they were tortured, and they were tortured in medieval ways. So, you know, brutal, brutal torture of the worst imaginable kind, right? Hot pincers, you know, pulling your flesh out or screws under your nails or, you know, the rack. Like, this isn't like waterboarding. This is real deal torture. And they were tortured into giving confessions. And as you can imagine, confessions given under that kind of torture are completely illegitimate. Uh, they were forced to give false testimony about themselves. So all of this shit is nonsense, right? Obviously, they were not stepping on the cross and spitting on the cross. They were literally Christian crusaders fighting and dying for Jesus, wearing the cross on their tabards. They were not blaspheming against Christ. This was just intended to slander them. And as you guys sometimes know, I've been on the end of that. I know how easy it is and how evil it is for people to just make up lies that make people look bad because it's politically expedient for them to do that. And that's exactly what happened to the Knights Templar. They were slandered. And then under torture, they were forced to confess. And so they were rounded up and most of them were killed. A lot of them were burned at the stake and also, you know, uh, dishonored by these slanders. And this was essentially so that this French king could avoid having to pay them back the debt that he owed them, as well as then they could steal all their treasure. But what's kind of fascinating is some of these Knights Templar escaped and were able to escape with most of their Knights Templar treasure. And nobody knows to this day exactly where where all that Knight Templar treasure is, nor do they know how many of the Knights Templar escaped or what they did after they escaped. And that's where some of these conspiracy theories start getting kind of juicy. So I did a podcast with my father called The Mystery of Oak Island, and I'm going to post that in the general chat. I highly recommend you guys listen to it, because if you've ever watched a show called The Curse of Oak Island, it's on TV, there's a place uh, in Oak Island where they called the Oak Island Money Pit, and they call it the money pit because, well, one, they think there might be incredible amounts of wealth there, but two, incredible amounts of wealth have been sunk into trying to excavate this pit. And people have spent their whole lives and gone broke and gone crazy and died trying to get into this pit. And they dig deeper and deeper and deeper and they find level after level. It's not just a hole in the ground. It's like a construction that's been built underground with tunnels and woodwork and traps and booby traps. And it's like ridiculously sophisticated, ridiculously huge, ridiculously deep. It's like wired up so that if you dig down, it floods and fills with water. And like, it's like really, really sophisticated. So whoever dug this pit was really trying to hide something there. And they still haven't gotten to the bottom of it. But as they get farther and farther down, they're starting to see more and more evidence that this is indeed a Knights Templar construction. So the, the leading theory right now is that the mystery of Oak Island is that this is actually where the Knights Templar hid their treasure. And they found artifacts associated with the Knights Templar that indicate that indeed the Oak Island money pit probably contains the Knights Templar treasure, which by the way is not necessarily only gold and silver, although it's definitely that, and they've actually tested the water, and the water is so saturated with silver, right, that it indicates that the amount of silver buried there must be, you know, trillions of dollars worth of silver, because uh, it actually like leaches into the water, and, and then they say the gold wouldn't leach, so there could be just as much gold, but they know there's a shitload of silver there, pardon my language. But the Knights Templar were, again, the ones who occupied the Temple of Solomon. So then you get into the whole story of Solomon. Well, Solomon was the most wealthy and famous king in the Bible. He was just, it goes into great detail about his phenomenal wealth and his gold and his ivory, and said all the kings of the world would bring him treasure and gold, and you know, he basically had so much gold and silver that, you know, you, they had not, no real use for it. You could make your floors out of gold and silver was, it said in that time, silver was accounted as nothing because like he had so much of it. But also Solomon was known for his wisdom. And according to the esoteric tradition, he summoned and bound demons uh, using the arts of Goetia. And so Goetia is like this occult practice for summoning and binding demons. And uh, basically the idea in this esoteric tradition is that he summoned and bound all these demons and used them to build this incredible temple for him. Uh, and also uh, it's believed that, so it's believed by some that the Knights Templar actually found the magical books and the magical artifacts of Solomon and so that they actually became like powerful sorcerers themselves. So some people buy into the slander, and they believe that they were actually powerful black magicians and sorcerers who were engaged in demon worship and worship Baphomet, uh, which is interesting, but I, I don't believe that. I believe they were absolutely loyal Christian uh, warrior knights who were slandered by a corrupt and greedy king, 
But what is true is that they probably had some pretty sacred artifacts. And basically, it's believed they had the Spear of Destiny, uh, which actually they supposedly dug up excavating and were so inspired by finding the sort of Spear of Destiny uh, that they then won some really decisive battle that they should have lost because it was such a massive boon to their morale that it, they rallied around this, right? When they were about to lose against the Muslims, they, they found the Spear of Destiny, and then they were so, you know, in awe of this discovery that they won. And again, what is the Spear of Destiny? The Spear of Destiny is the spear that was driven into the side of Jesus Christ while he was on the cross, and then blood and water came out into what? Into the Holy Grail. And this ties back into the knights, uh, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table thing, because Sir Galahad and the knights were questing for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is what caught the blood and water that spilled out after the Spear of Destiny was thrust into Christ. So those two artifacts, the Spear of Destiny and the Holy Grail, very important. And the third one is the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant, of course, was used to hold the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from the temple, uh, from the mount, uh, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and I think there's some other uh, unknown and known artifacts inside the Ark of the Covenant. So the truly intriguing theory is that perhaps in Oak Island, they're not just going to find all the, the wealth of the Templars, but they might actually find the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and the Spear of Destiny. So that is all very interesting, and that's ongoing, by the way. And we're going to have my father, uh, Hawthorne Waxwing, a.k.a. Lucky Dog, back on the server soon to do a follow-up on the ongoing excavation of the Oak Island thing. And again, I'll post the existing episode. It's quite interesting. So that could happen in our lifetime, that they could finally it's going to be like that. what it is. Um, and it's I'll finish up my presentation part pretty quick here. Uh, so I just want to point out, not only did they get a way to hide their treasure, but this elite, uh, influential, powerful, wealthy group of people obviously continued to exist in some way, shape, or form. So one thing that's worth pointing out is that the world's biggest secret society today, the Freemasons, uh, in one of the two divisions, there's Scottish Rite and York Rite, I, I always mix it up, but one of them has 33 degrees. And in the one that has 33 degrees, one of the very highest degrees of masonry is called Knights Templar. So the Knights Templar is a rank within the Freemasons, one of the highest ranks. So the argument here is that the Knights Templar went underground and either founded or intertwined with the Freemasons, and so that the Knights Templar continue to exist and be influential and powerful as high-ranking Freemasons. It's also worth pointing out that there have been reboots of the Knights Templar that still exist today. You could argue those are more like fan clubs uh, than anything else, right? Inspired by, kind of like the server is inspired by them. Uh, and also there's even a drug cartel in Mexico called the Knights Templar. Um, you know, a powerful and dangerous drug cartel. And they're kind of interesting because they're engaged in all the evil shit that drug cartels are usually involved in, like, you know, drug trafficking, not necessarily evil, but, you know, arms trafficking, human trafficking and things like that. But they take a very strict oath. They don't use any drugs themselves uh, to the point that even though they're selling cocaine and all these other drugs, they actually drug test all of their members and will kill any of their own members who fail these drug tests. And they have this, like, really strict... Uh, set of principles they follow. They're like a highly ethical, like saintly drug cartel called the Knights Templar, who are anti-drug drug traffickers, if you can figure that out. So I just bring that up because, you know, the Knights Templar still exists as this big, powerful drug cartel, as the Freemasons, they have influence on occultism, you know, the esoteric community, the conspiracy theory community. And I'll post some articles or videos that literally say they're kind of behind everything, uh, whether that's true or not. So that basically is the spiel I wanted to give you guys to just kind of catch you up on what I know about the Knights Templar. And, you know, as for why I chose that, honestly, I didn't really choose the term the Temple Mount when I was making the server. I paused and thought, what is it going to be called? And, you know, we're word right it just came to me the temple mount i'd never thought of it before it never crossed my mind it didn't like grow in me and i went with it it was just given to me like it literally was like spoken into my mind I said let it be the temple mount and as soon as i heard it and i like, heard it i was like, yeah that's it 100 percent went with it didn't look back so the temple mount is the goal right it is the goal of the knights templar was the temple mount it represents 
their highest spiritual aspiration. It is the physical and geographical representation of the Christian impulse, of the Christian desire, right? Just like in the King Arthur legend, it's represented by the Holy Grail. And Sir Galahad finds the Holy Grail, and it holds the blood of Christ, which offers salvation and eternal life. So it represents finding salvation through Christ, and therefore it is the object of the quest. Well, in a greater sense, the Temple Mount is the object of the quest. And some of you may have heard my testimony when I was born again in the Holy Spirit, right, and became a convicted born-again Christian. I had this really powerful religious experience, and during that experience, I prayed silently to God in my heart what I guess was my deepest desire, and that was just, again, instinctive. I hadn't thought about it. But I said, God, I want to be a holy warrior in your cause, right? That was my prayer. I said, God, I just want to be a holy warrior in your cause. And God answered that prayer the following day when a friend of mine through the server said, you know, Shogun, I have a lot of spirits inside of me, uh, possessing me. He said, like, I have like a thousand spirits inside of me. But there's also the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the strongest one. And it's the Holy Spirit that's speaking right now. And he said, you know, Shogun, sometimes God calls someone to be a holy warrior in his cause. And I think right now he's calling you. Right? And when I say this, it sounds cliche. It sounds silly. Like this wouldn't happen. This is the truth. That's what happened. I prayed silently in my heart the day before. said, I want to be a holy warrior in your cause. The next day, a friend of mine who wasn't a Christian whatsoever, who's actually called himself like Illuminati gang and 666 gang and was more like a satanic figure. And he goes, you know, I've got a thousand spirits possessing me, but also the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaking right now. And he's saying, you, Shogun, are being called to be a holy warrior in God's cause, which was exactly the words that I had prayed to God, holy warrior, right? And then you guys all know about the round table, how all the characters in the round table, like Merlin, Queen Guinevere, King Arthur, and Lancelot were real people. And all the symbolism of that, even up to the betrayal of Lancelot, which ultimately led to the dissolution of the Round Table server, just like in the King Arthur legend, the betrayal of King Arthur by Lancelot leads to the end of Camelot and the breakup of the Knights Round Table. So the whole story literally ran its course from beginning to end. Me, I became a Christian. I was Sir Galahad. So finding the Holy Grail symbolizes me becoming a Christian, finding eternal life, and Lancelot's betrayal led to the end of the Round Table. And that led to the creation of the Temple Mount, and God gave me the name Temple Mount, full formed, which ties into the Crusades, to King Melchizedek, to the Knights Templar, who were holy warriors in God's cause. And so I see this as the evolution of what God wants to do through these Discord communities that we build and populate together. Now, obviously, this still is not a Christian server. You're welcome to have whatever religion you want. All are welcome. We want to debate. We want diversity. You know, it's not a Christian server, but the Knights Templar are an explicitly Christian concept. They wear the red cross on their chest. And in the same way, I do the Church of the Mount or the Church of Camelot on Saturdays, and I will evangelize and uh, allow God's gospel to be preached in the community without shoving it down anybody's throats or making it mandatory. So hopefully that kind of explains a little bit about what the Temple Mount means, why it's meaningful, why it's relevant why it ties into everything from the religious aspect of the server to the um, conspiracy theory aspect of server and even the occult aspect of the server it ties it all together really nicely. And there's obviously a million angles to go, like the Oak Island thing, the Temple of Solomon, the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, the Spear of Destiny, the Freemasons, all of these nicely connect. And so this can just be the first podcast in a series where we, you know, untangle these various threads. Uh, and I think we will find that the Knights Templar are kind of only one degree of separation away from pretty much every interesting topic, from international banking to Freemasonry to Goetia and magic, right? And Baphomet and everything else. So thank you for letting me uh, monologue. I really appreciate it. Does anybody have a question, uh, a comment, or something that they want to contribute on the subject of the Knights Templar? I do, and like uh, it's more of a comment because I was reading more about like uh, the Knights Templar's relation to the Temple Mound itself, and I think if it is on theme enough for you, the name Templum Domini might be very interesting for the server. It means the same thing, but one's uh, apparently the Templar's word for it. 
Uh, right. So the templum domini, templum would mean temple and domini would mean of God, right? So the temple of God is the temple that would have been on the temple mount. So the temple mount would have been mounted by the temple of God or templum domini. So that's a very good thing to remember, right? The temple mount is only the ground on which the temple is built. It's the temple itself, which is significant, and the temple perhaps needs still to be built. So in a sense, you could say, you know, the server, it exists, the temple mount is here, but we're still in the process of building that, that templum domini, that temple of God, uh, on the foundation that we've already laid here. Um, and of course, that also ties into the fact that the Jews are also determined to actually build the third temple on the temple mount in real life. And that is believed that when they do that, that's going to bring about the return of Jesus Christ as well as the end of the world, the judgment day and Armageddon, the final battle. So in terms of like intensely significant symbols uh, that tie together the past, present and the future, I don't think you can do much better than this, which is again, like kind of amazing. Cause again, I, I had not been thinking about the temple mount. It was not something that had been like percolating in my mind. It just came to me, right? It was given to me in that moment of thought. Without any real thought, I just like, what is it? Temple Mount, boom. And it's interesting, too, because I didn't choose the name The Round Table either, right? That was also given to me. I didn't have that concept myself. It was given to me, and it ended up being so important. And in the same way, the Temple Mount thing is kind of given to me. Um, with, so, yeah. So thank you for that addition. And uh, I don't think we're going to change the name of the server to Temple Domini, at least not in any time soon. I like Temple Mount the way it sounds. But it's good to remember that the Temple Mount is only important because the Temple of God goes on top of it. I have an addition. Uh, well, not an addition. It's just really a, a trivia. Many Knights Templar, while being persecuted, took refuge in Portugal. The King of Portugal helped them. And they, they changed under the name of Order of Christ. And what's interesting is that the Order of Christ played a big part in the colonization of Brazil. You can see all the, all the depictions, well, pretty much all the depictions of the, of the ships that came to Brazil, all of them had the same symbol from the Order of Christ stamped in their sails and in their flags, and they helped to bring the, the Christian religion to the natives. That is very interesting. Thanks for adding that. And there's another connection, right? Black Feathers talks a lot about Brazil, and we've wanted to do a podcast on Brazilian history. And here you go. It turns out that the Knights Templar played an important role in, in Brazil, and that's yeah, another example. There was a sectum of the Order of Christ in Brazil, and perhaps it's even living to this day. I do believe it is, mm. in fact. Absolutely. That's right. fascinating. And I did come across one thing, which is that, you know, when the Knights Templar were betrayed, uh, obviously they weren't universally betrayed. They still had allies, they still had friends, and they still had people who respected them. And there was a king, it may have even been the very king you're talking about, who defied the order to arrest them, right? They were ordered by the Pope or whatever to arrest all the Knights Templar, and this guy refused. Not only did he refuse, he allowed the Knights Templar to reform under a different name, which I believe was the Knights of Christ. And so the Knights of Christ continued as a successor to the Knights Templar into the future. And so, you know, in multiple ways, the Knights Templar were not exterminated. Like, they didn't come to an end. They continued to exist uh, in various forms, and it's unknown to what extent those existing threads became integrated into governments banking institutions, religions, the Catholic Church as we know it today, and secret societies. So it may very well be that the Knights Templar do continue to be behind the scenes. Their uh, Black Feathers posted the history of the Order of Christ. That's exactly what I was referring to, the Knights of Christ, who are the continuation, direct continuation of the Knights Templar. I also posted two videos in uh, general chat. The Templars are behind everything, right? So that's going to give you some of these connections and the rise and fall of the Knights Templar. So if you guys are interested, please watch those. And I'm also going to dig up the, um, the podcast episode that I was referring to uh, about Oak Island um, so that you guys can listen to that um, when you're ready. Thank you, Black Feathers, for that very important addition. Does anybody else have a question or a comment or an addition on the subject of the Knights Templar? I do. I used to always think that, um, you know, stories of pirates and the bad guys, I think that they were all 
manipulation, like twisted stories of the Knights Templar leaving by ship, and now the 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 governing agencies that were after them were just telling the public there were these bad pirates that they were that were lawless and they needed to be captured. I always saw the pirates as the ones that actually were the the good guys trying to get away at that time. Well, that's very possible, right? Because the Knights Templar did have their own fleet, right? The Knights Templar had their own uh, navy or their own fleet of ships. So, yeah, definitely they, they could have escaped on their ships, and maybe some of them did turn to piracy as a way to survive. Uh, or maybe they were just slandered as pirates, um, exactly as you say, as another part of the campaign of, of smear campaign against them. So that's uh, another connection that we could look into, you know, uh, what connection, if any, the Knights Templar have to, to pirates, uh, historically or in fiction. That is a very fun concept, because I've heard that myself, that most piracy within the Caribbeans within the uh, 15, 16, 1700s a lot of those uh, pirate captains, these very famous ones, had their roots, their ships at least, or their own legacy, steeped within the Templar tradition. It's, it's uh, very funny to think where they left, where they went to after they left France. Yeah, that's fascinating. So uh, Black Feathers is posting about these uh, pirate ships that have the... Uh, the red cross on them, which is obviously a symbol of the temple symbol of the Templars. I also posted there the podcast uh, about Oak Island and the Oak Island mystery. And again, I'm going to have my father on in the near future to follow up because he's very deep into this particular conspiracy theory, and he's been continuing to research it as well as following this ongoing documentary show. So he's. I highly encourage you guys to listen to that episode. It's one of our more popular episodes. A lot of people really liked it. And uh, we'll be adding like a, an addition, carrying on the story where that episode leaves off. So please do listen to it and look forward to Lucky Dog coming back on uh, for Oak Island Part 2. And we'll definitely dig into the Knights of Christ that uh, Black Feathers brought up. We'll research that. We'll do a follow-up podcast on that subject and what they got up to. Um, but does anyone else have uh, anything to add about the Knights Templar in any way, shape, or form at this point, right? Historically, mythologically, for example, Crimson Raven has a very interesting and unique uh, take on the Templar concept. So, Crimson, I think you missed the podcast up to now. Hopefully you'll listen to it later. But do you perhaps anything have anything you want to say about the concept of the Knights Templar or, or Templars? And um, yeah, I get like, so... The Templars are an interesting thing because they're so mysterious, right? And I, I do believe that whatever kind of we understand as a Templar today is maybe not quite what it was in ancient times. Like, because like Templar, the word, the word itself, temp means time and then lar means uh, overseer or guardian. So it's like they seem like they could have had some sort of like... Uh, supernatural abilities in my opinion maybe like some some sort of secret occult supernatural abilities because there's a lot of things like especially like in that part in the bible where jesus is like on mount sinai and fucking uh, what's his name like moses and that other prophet like appear to him uh through like a portal like all of these ridiculous things that they're doing the in today's 2022 world the, the easiest way to like kind of rationalize it is that they have some sort of like time space manipulation abilities, which means that they obviously know something that, you know, we still to this day, it's like the biggest secret on the world, whatever it really is. But I do think that they do have something to do with like uh, controlling like time, timelines, uh, events, like historical events. Um, Cause they do all seem to play big, huge parts in throughout history, maybe less, less so today than they did back then. But, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, and uh, it does tie back into what we mentioned before. So one of the narratives about the Knights Templar is that they were extremely powerful, like wizards, basically. And because, again, they're, we, we shorten it to Knights Templar, but they're actually called like the poor Knights of the Temple of Solomon. So specifically, what temple? The Temple of Solomon, who was Solomon, the wisest and wealthiest king. But also, according to esoteric tradition, he was the master of Goetia, right? That's why if you look at Goetia, which is the occult study of summoning and binding demons, 
to do magic, they're called the lesser and greater keys of Solomon, right? The keys of Solomon, the king. So the idea is that Solomon had this Goetia magic system where he could bind and summon demons to do anything he wanted, including controlling time and space, supernaturally building the temple, bringing the materials. All these things are thought to have been done by uh, bound demons. And so the idea is the Knights Templar were called that because they actually controlled and inhabited the remains or ruins of Solomon's temple, and that's supposedly where they dug up the Spear of Destiny. So could they have dug up the tools and books of magic used by King Solomon, right? And then could they therefore have actually had these kind of time-space control powers because they had access to the secret occult wisdom and technology of King Solomon? Possibly, right? I mean, at least it's a, it's a coherent train of thought, so it's, it's interesting find it it's like the only way to uh bring the idea that any of these supernatural tales are were reality right like so especially like you said with king solomon uh he he had the ability to do things that just like were outside the realm of physics like he could make things levitate he could like he had control over like a thousand demons so let's just say he bound them all to like a ring using like a cult magical rituals and like somehow they they helped influence them and like uh even in today's day and age uh a lot of people hold the position that like these magicians like people like uh you know David Blaine and people like uh Chris Angel that they also have used similar occult rituals to basically create like whether they're like egregores or demons or, or uh, servitors to essentially help them in these uh fantastical displays that they do that's right. I mean, magic in a true sense, like uh, magic is, you know, as we've covered in other podcasts, like the art and science of causing change in accordance with the will, not necessarily employing um, supernatural entities like demons, but sorcery is specifically using spirits and demons to do your magic. And generally, this is thought to be the most powerful kind of magic, but also the most dangerous or the most forbidden because it's black magic because you're dealing with demons right but someone like uh brother drew right a member of the server would say oh well they do it you know with authorization of god like as a holy they use holy prayers and angelic names of god and bindings so they're not really evil it's not like they're making pacts with demons like a black satanist would satanist would instead they're using holy magic to bind and compel these demons to do something good or whatever so again the reason i bring this up is because i've met people who were like when we originally had the round table the first rank of knight what we called knight was originally called templar and so there was a, a templar theme in the original round table in the early days everything comes full circle and i had people come in and be like oh wow why are you aligning yourself with the knights templar don't you know that they were you know worship baphomet and they were sorcerers and black magicians and i believe that that's not true right that was the slander that was libeled against them by the king who they owed who owed who was who he owed them a lot of money i don't know why that was so hard to get out he owed them a lot of money and so he slandered them as these baphomet worshipers who you know spit on christ and that and then they tortured them into confession and that was all part of their slander in order to take their money and and so forth but there are some people and so i believe they were genuinely holy warriors right holy warriors of god they were you know under the crusade right they were burying the cross of christ and fighting and dying on the behalf of jesus i believe they were true christians and genuinely holy warriors but i'm just pointing out there is a whole narrative that that wasn't all slander that they really did secretly worship some kind of baphomet character and that they may have had this black magic grimoires and these powerful supernatural abilities and again, we haven't fully articulated their connection to the Freemasons, right? Um, NSA, which is the, the two divisions of Freemasonry that has 33 degrees? Is that... Is that Scott, Scottish, right? Right. And are you familiar with how one of the high ranks in the Scottish uh, right is the Knights Templar? Um, are you familiar with that you're a Mason shill? <laughs> so I don't know much more about it other than one of the highest ranks in Freemasonry is the Knights Templar. So there's a direct connection. And actually, Masons, right? What are they referring to? Well, Hiram Abiff or whatever is some Mason. Like, Masons are like stone workers, and they built temples, right? So the Masons were the temple builders all the way back to the I Temple of Solomon. Here, there's from, like, the mystery schools, which are Pythagorean, that he got from 
ancient Egypt stories that there's some Mason that like they killed somebody and like had a kind of secret pact or some shit. I don't fucking know. It's all allegory, but it's like 3000 years old and like, dude, I don't know what to tell you, but the Knights Templar were not, we're talking to aliens and like that, what they were worshiping, what they thought was demons for sure. Like mm -hmm. it, that was real. Cause they, they, they've been here doing this with people and I know that they were doing with them. So I know that you want to play the no, it was propaganda, but the, the King and they're all fucking evil too. It's not like that, but they were also worshiping at the time they were both evil. And it's just like, who was the good evil? You know what I mean? Like they were definitely not uh, warriors of Christ. They were interacting with, with, with demons for sure. Like this, well, this ET creature has been doing this stuff here for a while, bro. No, I mean, that's great. I mean, so the point of this podcast is to, point out how the conspiracies about them and the theories about them go in all different directions. But you're saying that, yeah, they were actually involved with these, you know, non-human intelligent. Yeah, sure. They speak our language and they spoke their language then, and they were able to communicate through the same technology of auditory telepathy. You know, yeah. And when you hear that and, and you think it's something, yeah, you're going to, you're going to listen to whatever they do. So here's something. So especially back then, dude, especially back then. Yeah, well, no, that's fascinating. That's another piece of the puzzle, and it, it all kind of uh, ties together. Another thing that's really interesting is one thing that the Knights Templar were accused of was worshipping or having a head, a severed head, and that this severed head could speak in prophecies and could say, like, knowledge and secret knowledge, the severed head. Now, this is really bizarre because some of you guys have played the video game series Assassin's Creed. Now, I've never played any of the Assassin's Creed games, but I know that they are set in a setting that is based on the Knights Templar. And in this game system, actually, I think the Knights Templar are generally the antagonist or the bad guy, and the main character or protagonist plays an assassin, which is really interesting because this is historical, right? The, there was this, another secret society called the Hashashim, which is the origin of the word assassin. Hashashim becomes assassin, just like through the game of telephone. And they were Muslims, right? Whereas the Knights Templar were Christians. And so they obviously saw all Muslims hate crusaders, generally speaking, because they see them as these invading you know, terrorists. Whereas from the Christian point of view, there were holy warriors who were fighting back against Muslim incursion and jihad. And that's a whole other question. We should do a whole podcast about the crusades and all the controversies around the crusades. But the assassins were also a mystical order of deadly warriors, and they also had a severed head, which is really bizarre. So the knights, the assassins, will have to do a whole podcast on them, too, because they're super fascinating. There was a guy called the Old Man of the Mountain, and the Old Man of the Mountain had an impregnable fortress that was built on, like, a cliffside. And so because this fortress was really well made and it was built, like, on a cliffside... It was impossible to take this fortress by force because you'd have to be coming up this like narrow path. They could, you know, defend it indefinitely. It'd be impossible to take by force. And it had all kinds of gardens and stuff, so you couldn't starve them out either. And basically what this guy, the old man of the mountain, did is he would take initiates and make them into brainwashed uh, assassins, right? And they were so um, convinced by what he in indoctrinated them into that they would kill whoever they were ordered to kill after spending however much time secretly getting close to this person by playing a role, right? pretending to be his friend, his lover, his counselor. And then when the time was right, they'd assassinate the guy. And then they'd just wait and let themselves be killed. They wouldn't try and escape or anything because they were convinced that when they died, they would go to paradise uh, and they would be rewarded with eternal life in heaven, which is, you know, the same as Muslim terrorists today who commit suicide bombings because they believe they're going to go to paradise. They, these assassins were Muslims and they believed the same thing back then. But the fascinating thing is how he did this now, and this may not be true, right? There's two ways to read this. One, he actually showed them paradise and they actually saw a magical talking head that told them prophecies or what most people think today. He had this beautiful inner courtyard in his castle with gorgeous naked young women, fountains, meat hanging from the trees, brocade and gold furniture, wine and everything, which if you know Islam, that's how they describe paradise or jhana. It's, it's a paradise of meat and sex and beautiful girls and gardens and food and alcohol. Uh, it's a pleasurable kind of heaven like that of human delights. 
well, he was wealthy and powerful, so he actually had this, right? He had the gorgeous girls, the, the wonderful gardens and all that. So he would indoctrinate these people. Then when he was ready, he'd bring them in and he'd give them hash, large amounts of hash. Pretty sweet call, right? And that's why they're called hashashim. So then when they were completely zonked out in hash, he'd take them into the inner courtyard and he had a person buried up to their neck in the ground on like, and then a silver platter around the neck. So it looked like a severed head, but really it was supposedly a guy buried up to his shoulders. And then that head would like say weird shit and prophecies and stuff. And they'd be like just so blown away by the hash, the girls, the garden and the talking head that they actually believed that they had like died and gone to heaven or to paradise. Right. And so he said to them, well, hey, he'd let them stay there for a while and enjoy the delights. And then he'd say, if you want to come back here forever, all you have to do is carry out this assassination and die. And when you die, you'll come back here and you'll be in paradise forever. And so they believed it, and they were then completely willing, mind-controlled, brainwashed slaves who would kill. The reason this is so bizarre, though, is because in the Assassin's Creed games, and to some extent real life, the Hashashim and the Templars were enemies, and they interacted, but they both had a severed head that spoke in prophecies. That was something they said about the Knights Templar and about the Assassins. So that's just something I think is really intriguing. Was it the same severed head? Did they both use that tactic? Or was yeah. it something else going on? Yeah, and in relation, um, MI6 was created by John D in the 1600s, channeling interdimensional demons, and they used the occult and Satanism to recruit their assassins as well as the story goes, which is kind of interesting. Right, so they may have been developing and mastering these techniques ever since. Maybe both orders use them. There's definitely a lot more to break down here. I also just want to I briefly mention... Um, I think... Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. I just wanted to say it might be fair to mention too, in some regard, that the game also has a tie-in to like the world being a simulation that's controlled that could be jumped in and out of. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, again, I haven't played the game, so I'm sure there's a lot to unpack. But uh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, in regards to the Templars too, like they were the first international bankers um, because they had a navy when they were they were doing banking around the seas and so forth. And they have current modern day roots into <laughs> Switzerland. With the, they the, were the not the first first international. No, they were the first international. Like they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, 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 yeah, yeah. We yeah. covered that a little bit earlier. Um, there's probably more than one origin of banking, but they were definitely one of the original international bankers, and a lot of people say they oh, certainly yeah. invented, invented no, banking. Or, we could banking was invented in, long before that. I'm saying international. They, they, exactly. Their first check was in 400 BC uh, by uh, the Jews in, in Iran. Right. So, And another thing I wanted to just mention is they were said to worship Baphomet, some people think that Baphomet is actually a transliteration of Mahomet, which actually is Muhammad. So there's just like all these weird connections, Baphomet, Muhammad, the Assassins, the Templars, uh, the Freemasons, uh, King Solomon, Solomon's Temple, banking, drug cartels, uh, sorcery, the Knights of Christ, the Catholic Church, and therefore the Jesuits. I mean, basically everything, the, the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant. The weird, ones, uh, the weird ones is Switzerland. Like in 1927, Ewan Cameron for MK Ultra was trained in psychology. And then uh, Kim Jong-un went to school in Switzerland. And a lot of Switzerland is very heavily Masonic, the Knights Templar stuff and banking and neutral and all that other stuff. So there's there's and uh, the Roman Swiss Guard. You know, it's just like there's tie-ins with all this stuff. It's it's pretty creepy. Yeah, that is fascinating, actually. And, you know, the Swiss are one of the most important power players in the modern world. And they're so powerful that they're almost universally ignored. People talk about the Freemasons. They talk about the Jesuits. They talk about the Luciferians and all these things. Almost nobody talks about the Switzerland connection. But Switzerland is super powerful. Also, the Swiss Guard, right, the elite Swiss Guards, if you ever listen to the awesome Sabaton song, the 189, about the elite Swiss Guard who defeated like 10,000 uh, enemies and saved the Pope and saved the Vatican, right? 189 guys killed like 10 or 30,000. But the point is those Swiss Guard, they're the bodyguards of the Pope. And it always occurred to me that a bodyguard is also a nice way of saying 
keepers, right? So if you have a group of elite too. soldiers around you all the time as your bodyguards, they're also holding you hostage because they could kill you at any time. So essentially the Swiss hold the Pope hostage and have done so for hundreds of thousands of years. And so that just gives you a, uh, they protect him, right? But obviously if you're surrounded by elite soldiers with, with weapons who are trained to kill, then they protect you, but they also can kill you at any time. So that gives you an inclination of how powerful Switzerland is, its connection to the Pope. And of course, as I mentioned, there are still, even though the Knights Templar have officially been disbanded as a knightly order, there do still exist knightly orders, uh, the Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem and the Knights Malta. And those are both part of the Catholic Church, just like the Knights Templar were. And they still have thousands of knights under arms today, to this day. And so we'll have to do podcasts about them. And they are connected to the Jesuits. And I know Sign or a Citizen, for example, always points out how the Jesuits are connected to everything. So, again, this is only going to be episode one about the Knights Templar. At least we've identified a lot of threads that we can go into in future episodes. Uh, and so, I, again, I think this this name, the Temple Mount, that was kind of given to me or, or to us is amazing, right? Because it ties together everything, the religious aspects, the occult aspects, the conspiracy theory, the modern day, the historical, the mythological, the symbolic. It's all there, right? Even the King Arthur connection and the Knights of the Round Table connection through the Holy Grail. So it really is an evolution of a concept, and it's really just opens doors into every conceivable avenue of investigation. So, um, Hi. yeah, I'm excited to go into it more. If I may add something, the Jesuits also came to Brazil and established base here. And to this day, there are descendants of Jesuits. And I have in my possession a book, uh, a course of Latin written by a Jesuit. A Jesuit who, I well, I don't know if he's alive, if he, he's very old, but I... I can I can go like over how I discovered all this. It, it was quite the adventure. Of course, I'm not going to do now because it's a long story. But basically, this this man was a teacher of Latin in in uh, southern state of Brazil. That wrote uh, books uh, on on a course of Latin, and he he was he was a Jesuit, like certified. I have I have sources to back up that claim. Absolutely. We'd love to get into that in a future episode. So this podcast has opened up a million new podcasts we have to do, right? We got to do another podcast on Oak Island and the Templar treasure. We got to do a podcast, as we've discussed before, Black Feathers on Brazil and Brazilian history. We got to do a podcast on, you know, Goetia and, and the magic of King Solomon and the, the demon binding theories. We got to do a podcast on... The Jesuits and the existing knightly orders, like the Order of the Sepulchre of Jerusalem and the Order of Malta, uh, the Swiss and Switzerland connection, maybe even the pirate connection, uh, the assassins and the Hashishim, Baphomet, right? Those are just a few that come to mind. The Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, the Spear of Destiny. All of these could be podcasts of their own. All of them tie into the Knights Templar, and the Knights Templar were the ones who fought all the way to the Holy Mount and defended the Temple of Solomon that existed on that mount. So again, that's why we have the Temple Mount as the name of our server, and that's why we have the Knights Templar as our image. And again, it's perfect, because to me, right, they're the holy warriors of God. That was my prayer. And so it ties into my identity as a holy warrior and the whole spiritual warfare thing that I've been talking about in Church of the Mount and Church of Camelot. But it also ties into Crimson, right? One of his podcasts he did recently was about the Templar Complex. Really good podcast. Uh, and he sees it all through that magical, mystical aspect. NSA connects it to aliens, right? So you can see it's perfect for the community because it's so broad and enigmatic and deep that it, it unifies all of us and our different perspectives in this common narrative and this common set of symbols. So I, I couldn't be happier with it, really. And, well, I just and, connect all the occult to extraterrestrials, but yeah. Yeah, so the point is all of us have an angle on this, but nobody finds it uninteresting, right? It even ties into the cartels. I mentioned there's a cartel called the Knights Templar Cartel, um, you know, and on and on. Melchizedek, right? King Melchizedek ties into the Holy Grail. You know, he comes with a cup of wine in the book of Genesis. We talked about that in my Jesus the Phoenician podcast. 
So in a way, this is almost part three, right? Part one was the War in Heaven podcast that I did about, you know, all kinds of things. Part two was the Jesus the Phoenician podcast. Recently, that was the first episode of the Temple Mount. And part three, this one, about the Knights Templar. So it's about the War in Heaven, Knights Templar, Melchizedek, the Temple of Solomon, and who knows what else, right? So much more that we're going to get into. So does anybody else have a question, a comment, or something to add? I, I do have one other thing, and uh, that's just because it seems feng shui. You started off the conversation with a prayer, and I thought it might be fitting, if not even to end the conversation with a prayer. But also, I was just curious as to a personal philosophy that that maybe you would know about, or uh, what what the knights version of god's love would mean well i think it's a great idea to end with a prayer and i'm certainly happy to say that prayer unless perhaps you brother uh felt called by the holy spirit or called um to do so uh as for what the templar's vision of god's love was right i don't want to necessarily presume to know that or to say that right now but what I will say is, obviously, the Knights Templar were Christians, right? They were the Knights of Christ. They became the Knights of Christ, Knights of the Order of Christ. They wore the cross on their tabards. They fought and died with the cross of Christ on their chest, right over their hearts. And they believed enough in Christ to carry the cross all the way to the Holy Land through deserts and heat and hostility and enemies and hardships innumerable and overcome and persevere and triumph, right? So they believed very much in this. So what can we say? They had faith in God, they had faith in Jesus, but obviously they were not pacifists. They did not believe in turn the other cheek and forgive your enemy and, you know, be gentle and meek and mild and go like lambs to the slaughter. They were warriors of Christ. They fought and died and killed for their understanding of Christ and for religion. And again, this is going to have to be a whole other podcast, but people often have this idea that the Crusades were some evil, horrible thing where a bunch of just vicious, savage Christians just went and killed a bunch of Muslims because they just hated them and wanted to kill them. It's totally nonsense. By the time the Crusades were launched, three-fifths of Christendom had been conquered by a Muslim jihad. So from the time of Muhammad to the present day, Islam has waged unceasing jihad against the rest of the world. That is, you know, conversion and conquest through force. Islam divides the world into the Dar al-Islam, or House of Islam, or House of Peace, and the Dar al-Harb, which means House of War. So canonically, all of the world is either Muslim or at war with Islam, according to Islam's own theological understanding. And in the, in the Quran, it says, and fight and kill until religion is for none but Allah, meaning until all religion other than Islam is extinguished, including Christianity and Judaism. So... If it were not for the Crusades, and if it were not for the Templars who almost single-handedly won the Crusades that were won, and I do need to point out some of the Crusades were abominations, some of them were not Christian, there was many Crusades, some of them were completely unholy in nature and actually targeted other Christians, such as the one that slaughtered the Cathars, and that's another subject, the Languedoc Crusades and the Baltic Crusades. But the ones that actually went to the Holy Land and were actually against the Muslims, which was the point of the Crusades in general, those were wars of survival, right? If we had not had those crusades and if the Templars had not won them, none of us would be Christians today. We would not have Judeo-Christian civilization. We would not be having this conversation and all of us would be Muslims, right? The only reason that Christianity still exists is because the holy warriors like the Knights Templar picked up arms to defend the faith and to defend Christendom. And I just want to point out in the Bible, I'm, I'm going to read a few verses, so please be patient. It says, Jesus said, let he who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. He said, you, if you're a Christian, you should have the sword, even if you have to sell the shirt off your back. He also said, think not that I come to bring peace, I bring a sword. Right? That was what Jesus himself said. My favorite Bible verse, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for war. The Lord is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. And finally, wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good, right? So wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. If you unpack that sentence saying wisdom is better than weapons of war, but weapons of war are really important because without weapons of war, you can't kill the sinners. And if you don't kill the sinners, they're going to destroy everything that's good, including the church, 
Christianity, your family, your faith, and your nation. So that would be my answer to your question, Bobby, about what the form of God's love that the Knights Templar represented was. It was that love that a warrior has when he fights and kills to defend those whom he loves. I want to point out that, that, that a lot of what's going on in that is radical Islam is the term. But Klaus Schwab wrote a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset. He said, everything is fine. Everybody can be accepted, but radical Islam doesn't have a place. And I think that that is because a lot of revisionism that goes on in the world, you know, there is a lot of revisionism going on in Islam, but there is radical Islam. And that's kind of what you, you hang up on. I think you, you get hung up on it. Well, that's again, that's thank you. That's another subject. And obviously I've talked a lot about Islam in the past and we can talk about Islam in the future. So I'm not going to take the bait and derail the conversation into whether that is radical Islam or whether that's actually just Islam itself. Hint, that's just Islam itself. But uh, nevertheless, we'll, we'll, we'll put a pin in that and we'll discuss it uh, in the future. But thank you uh, for that. And uh, does anyone have anything else they'd like to ask or say about the Knights Templar or this podcast before we do close with a prayer? So thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for the awesome contributions. Everybody brought really interesting things. And I was really happy with how this and all the Temple Mount podcasts have come together so far. I do feel the Holy Spirit working through this community, through this podcast, and through these conversations, and through each of you guys. Um, but Bobby, it was you who suggested that we end with a prayer. Uh, we began with a prayer before the recording, because Brother Rokomo asked me to say a prayer for him. Uh, I don't know if that will make it into the recording or not. But did you want to say the prayer, Bobby, or do you feel that I should? I'm okay either way, but um, if you would like to say it, then I, that's up to you. Honestly, you can go ahead. I appreciate it, though. All right. Well, thank you for the suggestion, Bobby. I think it's a good one. I think it comes from the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, with faith we pray. God, I thank you for the incredible blessing that it is to be here with my online family, my virtual family, bound together by friendship and love and loyalty for years, uh, coming together through multiple communities, MK Ultra, the round table, and finally our home, our forever home, uh, the Temple Mount. And I just want to thank you, God, for strengthening this community over years, seeing us through so many different trials and tribulations, always bringing us out stronger and better. And in each and every day, in each and every way, God, just bringing such amazing things out of this community, the information, the friendships, the communication, the relationships, the conversations, the content, the artwork, you know, amazing things are being done in this community every single day, God. And I just want to thank you for each and every one of the people in this room and each and every one of the people in this server, God. And I just pray that you'll continue to bless them. You'll continue to bless this community, that you'll continue to guide this community through the Holy Spirit onto the furtherance of the kingdom of heaven, and that you will use me, God, as a sword in your hand and an instrument of your will, God, and that this community also, God, will be a place where your will can be done, God, and where it can manifest onto the furtherance of the kingdom of heaven and onto the accomplishment of the spiritual warfare which we wage and which we remember is not carnal. We do not wage against flesh and blood, but we wage war against powers and principalities of wickedness in the heavenly places, be they aliens, as NSA believes, be they archons or demons, God. Nevertheless, make us a sword in your hand that we may vanquish them, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, God, but spiritual and mighty, even unto the pulling down of strongholds and fastnesses. So let those strongholds of darkness be pulled down, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. With faith we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending, for listening, for participating. Amen. And a woman, as Dawson would say, please join us on the Temple Mount Discord server. Uh, please join us every day at 930 for the podcast, every day for the kickboxing class. Keep an eye on the announcements channel for upcoming events. There are kickboxing classes, interviews, debates, poetry slams, poetry workshops, occult magic seminars anything you can imagine, yoga classes, and much more coming up. So keep an eye on the announcements channel. Join us every day in the voice chat. Like, follow, and subscribe to our various YouTube, BitChute, and SoundCloud channels. And again, a deep thank you to Hugh for his excellent work on the SoundCloud. A deep thanks to Citizen Sign for his amazing work on the artwork and the calligraphy. 
to Black Feathers, to Dacian for their work on art, to Reckless for her work on art, and to Rafi for his wonderful work recording and uploading on the YouTube channel. And Rafi's mic for recording, as always. You guys are amazing. It's never been a better community on Discord, never been a better server to be a part of, or a better group of friends to have. So God bless you all. Much love. And let's just jump to uh, the video chat. Or, hey, Templar's Tavern. That seems more appropriate. Let's jump to Templar's Tavern. Thank you all so much. And this episode will be uploaded tomorrow. If you missed any part of it, please listen to the whole thing when it's uploaded tomorrow in the Temple Mount podcast channel. But for now, please join me in the Templar's Tavern. God bless.